The power to command men and give vehement impulse to their joint action is something which cannot be defined by words, but it is plain and manifest in battles. And whoever commands an army in chief must choose his subordinates by reason of qualities which can alone be tested in actual conflict. General William Tecumseh Sherman is renowned for his strategy and leadership and recognizes that only the best must be chosen to lead American soldiers on the battlefield. In the final years of the American Civil War, the United States Cavalry plays an ever-increasingly important role in the Union victory over the Confederate Army. With their expanding numbers, it is important that the cavalry be led by only the finest soldiers of their day. As General of the Army, Ulysses S. Grant has this to say about one of the cavalry's most storied leaders, Philip Sheridan. I believe General Sheridan has no superior as a general, either living or dead, and perhaps not an equal. General Sheridan, along with General George Armstrong Custer and legions of other cavalrymen, will soon turn their focus from the war between the states to the war to tame the Wild West. St. Louis, Missouri, December 17, 1860. Sir, I have today received a letter from Major Hunter, acceding gladly to my proposal to him to accompany you to Washington. We are old officers and old friends, and if any difficulty should arise, which is barely possible, I should hope we might be of some service to you. I am reading everything I can find on the events of the day, and the more I study them, the more I am convinced that secession is treason, not in a state collectively, but in the individuals of a state who contravene the laws of the United States, and who cannot be absolved from the obligation to obey those laws by any state authority. I do not believe it would be necessary for the general government to make war upon the seceding states. The collection of the revenues and the holding of the forts, which would be indispensably necessary, would be to some extent coercion, but still they would be defensive measures. And I think the people of the South will pause some time before they will go to war with the general government. Has it occurred to you, sir, that the white males of the cotton states are only about one-tenth of the white males of the whole country? What would posterity think of us as a people if we should let this one-tenth break up our glorious government? It is evident that affairs are becoming more and more complicated every day. But the greater the difficulties, the greater the glory in overcoming them. Will you please let me know when you will leave for Washington? And in the meantime, if I can be of any service to you, I beg you to command me. With highest respect, your obedient servant, E.V. Sumner, Colonel, USA. Edwin V. Sumner, who had spent much of his career training, recruiting, and commanding cavalrymen, was appointed senior officer to accompany President-elect Abraham Lincoln from Springfield, Illinois, to Washington, D.C. in March of 1861 on his way to assume his role as Commander-in-Chief. The United States Cavalry sees a shift in its duties during the American Civil War. While the mounted soldiers still see offensive action, duties of the Cavalry now include reconnaissance missions, hearkening back to the second light dragoons of the revolution, defensive actions meant to delay the onslaught of enemy forces, pursuit and harassment of defeated and retreating enemy forces, and long-distance raiding to capture enemy communications, supplies, and railroads. Organizations and designations are also shifted in a move that sees four types of mounted forces mobilized, cavalry, which fights mainly on horseback, mounted infantry, which moves on horseback but fights on foot, dragoons, a combination of light cavalry and infantry who fight both mounted and on foot, and the irregulars, soldiers for hire employed by both the Union and the Confederacy, with no standardization of weaponry or tactics, 
who would become more famous in their campaigns fighting on the side of the South. While dragoons were present leading up to and during the Civil War, the two official corps dragoons left in operation at the outbreak of the war were redesignated, the 1st and 2nd Cavalry. Prior to the war, the 1st and 2nd Dragoons had seen combat during the War of 1812 at the Battle of Lundy's Lane and the siege at Fort Meigs. The combined regiment of Light Dragoons had been dissolved three years after that war in 1815, but they were called upon to fight again during the Mexican-American War and during the violence that erupted between pro- and anti-slavery belligerents in Kansas and Missouri in the years leading up to the Civil War, in what came to be known as Bleeding Kansas. In 1861, the Union Army soon sees the need of a mounted strike force, and the 1st and 2nd Dragoons, now the 1st and 2nd Cavalry, become an integral part of the Army of the Potomac, mostly serving as reserve and backup defense serving, among other places, at the Battle of Gettysburg. In addition to the rigorous training, skill, and speed required of the cavalrymen, a key component to the mounted soldiers' victory on the battlefield are the weapons they use. By the Civil War, muskets and rifles were still in use, but technological advances had equipped the soldier with the revolver as well. In the 1868 book, Modern Cavalry, Lieutenant Colonel George Dennison, Jr., collects his own experience with cavalry munitions, as well as musings from General Stephen Lee and Colonel Harris von Bork on the tools that cavalry carry into the battlefield. We will consider here the different arms which have been in use in mounted forces and the comparative advantages and disadvantages connected with each taking into consideration the sword, the lance, the carbine, the pistol. Nearly all the cavalry used by the Confederate States, and in fact by both sides, was nothing more than mounted riflemen. The saber was done away with by the Confederate States cavalry pretty well and rarely used in action by either party, and in my opinion has lost much of its merit since the revolver has been brought to such perfection. The sword is a good weapon though, but little used during the recent war. One of these encounters, an affair of a few minutes, was with a newly organized regiment of Federal Lancers. They stood 300 yards from us in the line of battle, and presented with their glittering lances, from the point of each of which fluttered a red and white pennon, and their fresh, well-fitting blue uniforms turned up with yellow, a fine martial appearance. One of our regiments was immediately ordered to attack them, but before our Virginian horsemen got within 50 yards of their line, this magnificent regiment, which had doubtless excited the liveliest admiration in the northern cities on its way to the seat of war, turned tail and fled in disorder, strewing the whole line of their retreat with their picturesque but inconvenient arms. I do not believe that out of the whole body of 700 men, more than 20 retained their lances, and their sudden and total discomfiture furnished a striking proof of the fact that this weapon, formidable enough in the hand of one accustomed to wield it, is a downright absurdity and encumbrance to the inexperienced. Lomax had three brigades of Virginia cavalry armed principally with infield rifles, and these useless things for mounted men had nearly ruined the whole command. I'd rather command a regiment armed with good oaken clubs. If the men are critical of the weaponry thus far, they save their praise solely for the pistol, perhaps the most practical firearm for use on horseback, particularly while in motion as Colonel Gilmore continues. I saw the lieutenant run down under the riverbank, and several throw up their hands in token of surrender. But just as I thought all had given up, a sergeant mounted his horse and dashed at me, calling out to the men to follow him. There are only five men, said he, don't surrender to five men. 
Kemp had his revolver out and killed the brave fellow before he came within reach of my saber. But the rest had taken courage and began to mount and come at us with balls whistling around their heads. Had I drawn my pistols instead of saber, several would have fallen, for we were at close quarters. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.